In section 5.1, we're going to look at some applications of second-order linear differential equations with constant coefficients. In particular, we're going to look at spring mass systems. You might recall, perhaps from a, a physics course, um, that you know, according to Newton's law, that force is equal to mass times acceleration. If we look at the force that a spring exerts um, on a string by elongating it, it's going to be F equals to negative KS where k is the constant of proportionality, which we call the spring constant, um, and s is the, the distance displaced. If we kind of take absolute values to get the shear magnitude, we find that the absolute value of the force is equal to the spring constant times the absolute value of the, the displacement. For example, let's suppose we had a 10-pound spring that stretches the spring, excuse me, a 10-pound mass placed on a spring that stretches it a half of a foot, then the 10 pounds is the force. The distance in feet, and this is very important by the way, the distances in these have to be in feet. So we place the distance as 1 half times k, solve it for k, just multiply both sides by 2. We would see that the spring constant for this particular spring would be 20 pounds uh, per foot. When a mass m is attached to the lower end of a spring of negligible mass, it stretches the spring by an amount s and attains an equilibrium position. So if you look at kind of the, the diagram in the textbook, so let's suppose we have a spring. It's rigidly supported, meaning the support itself is not going to move. The string would have a, a natural length. Let's call that L. To that uh, spring, we are going to attach a mass, which will have some weight to it due to gravity. The force due to gravity is m times g. And that's going to stretch the spring and displace it a little bit to its new resting position, its new equilibrium position, which we will say it's going to be at an x value of x equals 2 to 0. Okay. And then from there, we can do a, a couple different things. We can take from the, the, in the, from the equilibrium position, we can either compress the string, or we can stretch the spring um, and then let it go. Or furthermore, instead of just letting it go, you could actually impart a velocity uh, one way or another by applying a force initially to the, the hanging mass. And then what we will happen, and what you'll notice is kind of like a slinky effect, is that you know it'll it'll oscillate back and forth. And what we want to determine is what is going to be the equation of motion for this um, uh, mass that's on attached to the spring. For us, we're gonna look at the case right now where we have um, free motion that's going to be undamped. So we're not gonna have any damping effect, meaning we're gonna uh, neglect things like air resistance, um, friction uh, of the, the system, etc. Another thing that's going to be very important for us in terms of understanding how this model works, again, our ultimate goal is to figure out where is the position of the mass at time t, and we're going to measure its position. We said a moment ago that x equals to zero is the equilibrium position of the mass. We will consider any mass that's pulled below that. So if the mass is below the equilibrium position, we will think of that as a positive x value. And if the spring is compressed a little bit, in other words, if the uh, mass is above the equilibrium position, then we will consider for those to be negative x values. Okay. And then what we end up with here is, if you look through the derivation, this is going to be our second order differential equation. It's linear with constant coefficients that will model the position of the spring. So for this type of motion, it's governed by this differential equation. d squared x squared dt squared plus omega, excuse me, plus omega squared x equals to 0. Where omega is squared is equal to k divided by m, where k is the spring constant and m is the, the mass of the spring. Okay? So again, the equilibrium position, that's where the, the mass would originally be hanging um, if it was just kind of let to its own device without any forces. Any position above this, so if I have uh, the block, let's suppose that it's up above here, that would correspond to negative x values. If the spring is stretched and it falls below that equilibrium position, then those are going to be positive x values. One of the ways in which I think it's probably easiest to kind of understand this is if you kind of thinking of the, the x value as the e amount of elongation of the, the spring, which is kind of really what we're modeling here. Obviously, if it's stretched, 
that would hang downward, that means that the spring is being made longer. So it's adding some additional length to it. So that additional amount X is greater than zero. On the other hand, if it's compressed, if it lies above the equilibrium position, then at that particular instance, the string is kind of smaller. So the spring is smaller than what typically would be. And you can think of kind of like the, the change in this length is kind of being negative or kind of adding uh, a compression factor to it. The other thing to kind of keep in mind is what the derivatives will look like in this case. Um, because of our signs in terms of the directions where x is uh, positive below and x is negative above, it will turn out that when dx dt is greater than zero, that the spring is actually going to be moving downward. So when the derivative is positive, the spring is actually on its way down. And conversely, if the derivative with respect to x dt is less than zero, then that's going to be precisely when the mass on the spring is going to be moving, moving up. Okay. So this is our model for 5.1. It's the only one we're going to be using. Let's go ahead then and solve this. So if we have our second order homogeneous differential equation, we know that the solution to this, we, our auxiliary equation would be m squared plus w squared equals to zero. We can solve for m, take the w squared to the other side, and then take the square root. And we get m equals plus or minus omega i. So we get two complex conjugate roots, which means that the solution is going to be x of t equals c1 times the cosine of omega t plus c2 times the sine of omega t. And you are more than welcome to, you don't have to rederive this every time. This will be the equation of motion. You can simply use this with the given information to find the value omega and plug it in and that will give you your equation of motion. Okay. And this was really of the form alpha plus beta i. And because alpha here is zero, there's no real part. You don't see the, the e part showing up here. Because that would just be, the whole thing would just be equal to, to 1. The other thing we want to make mention of is the initial conditions on this. We will consider x sub 0. So the time at time 0, the position, will be given by x naught. Again, if it's stretched below the equilibrium position, x naught would be positive. If it's above the equilibrium position, then x naught is negative. And then we'll also specify the initial speed of the spring when it's released. If it's released from rest, so in other words, if it's just let go, then this would be equal to zero. On the other hand, if it's either kind of accelerated up or accelerated down, we will refer to that initial velocity as x1. When x1 is greater than zero, then that means that the spring is released with a downward force. And should x1 be less than zero, then that means that the spring is released with an upward force. So let's go ahead and let's, let's solve one of these. In example one, they say we have uh, a spring. And we're told that it weighs two pounds. And the two pound weight stretches the spring six inches from its equilibrium position. At time equal to zero, it's released from a point that is eight inches below equilibrium. And with an upward velocity of four thirds feet per second. 
determine the equation of motion. So again, if you wanted to, you could write out, it's good practice to kind of get used. This is a very popular um, second order linear ODE, but again, it was the second derivative of x with respect to t plus omega squared x is equal to, to zero. So that's our ODE, and we already know that the solution, so we don't have to, to reinvent the wheel here. We know that the solution is this. It's x of t equals c1 cosine of omega t plus c2 sine of omega t. We just need to find omega as well as c1 and c2. And we recall that the value of omega, omega squared, okay, was equal to um, k divided by m. where k is our spring constant and m is our mass. Let's work on finding the mass first. So if we recall from Newton's uh, second law, force equals mass times acceleration. In particular, when we talk about the weight, weight is the force due to gravity. So weight is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to, to gravity. If we want to find the mass of something, all you need to do is take its weight and divided by gravity. And gravity on Earth, that's 32 feet per second squared. So we take our two pounds, divided by, actually I should not say that, um, uh, yeah, feet per second squared, divided by 32 feet per second squared. And this is gonna give us a value of 1 12th and then typically they refer to this as being in slug units because it's the, the mass. So we have M. We also need to find K. Remember, K, this is really related to the force of the spring constant K times the absolute value of the displacement of the spring. Well, one of the things that we know is that we know that the spring um, has a mass of, this has a weight of two pounds, so that's going to be the the force, we have our spring constant, and now let's be a little bit careful here about the, the, the um, S value. It says that it stretches the spring six inches. Here, everything else in this problem is in terms of units of feet. So this distance S must be in feet. So if we want to convert six inches to feet, we know that one foot is 12 inches and so naturally that's going to be one half of a foot so when we plug in our value for s here s should be one half and then multiply both sides by two and we get that the spring constant k is going to be equal to to four so k is equal to four and um that would be pounds per foot if you're keeping track of the units which all good science and math math students should Okay, so we know our M, M is 1 12th. We know that K is equal to four. So we should be able to plug this in to find um, omega. Remember, omega squared, this was equal to K divided by M. K is four. M is one over 12. Oh, excuse me, hold on one second. Uh, what's two divided by 32? It's a bad math morning. That's one over 16. So it should be one over 16. And then that's gonna give us 64. So omega squared is equal to 64. We can find omega by taking the square root and we get that omega is equal to, to eight. So just simply plugging this in, this will give our um, equation of motion. So everywhere we see omega, we can replace it with eight, 
Hopefully it doesn't freeze. Okay. So we said that X. Uh-oh. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. Let me just give me one minute here. Okay. So let's finish this first example off. So we had just found that a value for omega was 8. So we can go ahead and now plug that into our solution curve. We know that x of t is equal to c1 cosine of 8t plus c2 sine of, of 8t. And now from here what we want to do is we want to solve for c1 and c2. And this all goes back to the preliminary information. So let's solve the initial value problem to explicitly state our equation of motion. They say that it was released from a point that is 8 inches below equilibrium. So that's essentially saying that the value of x0 is equal to 8. Remember, if it's below, that's the positive direction. So x of 0 is equal to 8. And they also say that at that time equals to 0, it's released with an upward velocity of 4 thirds feet per second, which means that x prime of 0 is going to be negative 4 thirds. Again, because the positive upward direction is the, the negative direction. So it's a negative rate of change for x of 0. If we evaluate the function at 0, it should be equal to 8. So let's plug that in. When x is equal to 0, we get c1 times the cosine of 0 plus c2 times the sine of 0 is equal to 8. The cosine of 0 is 1. The sine of 0 is 0. So this implies that c1 is equal to 8. So we know that x of t is going to be 8 cosine of 8t plus c2 sine of 8t. We can now go ahead and take the, the first derivative. x prime of t is going to be a negative 64 sine of 8t plus 8c2 cosine of 8t. If we evaluate the derivative at 0, we're going to get negative 64 times the sine of 0 plus 8c2 times the cosine of 0. And this is supposed to be equal to negative 4 thirds. This implies that 8 times c2 will be negative four thirds, and then simply divide both sides by eight, and we're gonna get that C2 is gonna be, it'd be negative four over 24, which should reduce to negative one sixth. And now we know the value of C2. So our equation of motion is gonna be x of t equals eight cosine of eight t minus one sixth the sine of 18.